Hello and welcome to a last video in this course on machine dynamics. And this video deals with well, the rigid reciprocating engine or the slider crank mechanism. The slider crank mechanism is shown here. So basically it consists of a crank that rotates. So the point A, the end point of that crank, is on a circular motion around the center point of that crank. Finally, we have the connecting, or second, we have the connecting rod between that circular motion and the piston or cylinder. And that cylinder moves on the x-axis, so it's a linear motion. So basically, it's the mechanism that connects a rotational motion to a linear motion. And this makes the motion of the whole slider crank mechanism a periodic but non-harmonic motion. You see that there are a lot of details in um, that figure. But what I use here at the moment is just first the geometry, the kinematics. The kinematic relationships are obtained from the length of that crank, from the length of the connecting rod, and finally from the displacement of the cylinder. So by observing that the points O, the center point of the crank, the point A, the connection point between the crank and the connecting um, shaft, and finally the point B that uh, belongs to the shaft but also to the piston, um, form a triangle. We will analyze that uh, geometric relationship closer in order to be able to derive the equations that govern not only the motion of the system or other than the motion of the system, the reaction forces that we will get for that mechanism, namely the reaction force, forces in the bearing O and related to well, some kind of support that must be available here for the piston. And once we determine these reaction forces, uh, an important question is, is it possible to reduce the reaction forces to zero? In the same sense as we balanced a rotor with an imbalance. But here we do not speak of, of a classical balance. It's rather a, well, balancing of, of masses in a, in a um, periodic motion. That is, uh, there is some kind of, um, well, bearing force designed in that system that is wanted instead of an imbalance, which is something that is unwanted, which is some deviation from the ideal behavior. Here, the ideal behavior has already an, uh, uh, reaction forces. And the question is, can we modify the design in such a way that the reaction forces are equal to zero? How can we modify that? And then there is a last point that brings me to well, not the equations of motion that will not be derived, but they were shown how they, how they can be derived here and brings me to the final question uh, whether there is a sta stationary motion. We will see there is no stationary motion for that situation um, due to the periodicity of the motion. And uh, therefore, the periodicity also um, in the velocity and in the accelerations. But whether we can control that motion uh, to a certain extent, so allow the um, rotation speed to um, have some deviations from a stationary value, but could control these deviations such that they are small. So this is the, the content of the video. First, I would start with the kinematics and the derivation of expressions for um, all the uh, quantities that are needed in the dynamic analysis. Um, if you consider the kinematics, then it is clear this is a mechanism that has one degree of freedom. Uh, usually the crank angle is taken here as the degree of freedom makes sense because you could imagine that you control this um, a rotation of the crank and then all the other motions will follow. So we will base our analysis on the crank angle as the independent variable here. And um, 
then what you get is when you get one simple relationship, I will show you the first one that is uh, obtained by equating the height here in that triangle, one's coming from the left hand side and one's coming from the right hand side. So R sine phi would be an expression for that height, but L sine psi would be also an expression for that height. You can see though so, that it is very easy to um, relate the sine of the angle psi to the sine of the angle phi and therefore to the crank angle. On the other hand, the expression for x becomes more involved, which makes sense because we have that transfer from a rotational motion in a linear motion, which is really a very complex thing. So, for x, you will find a contribution from the crank angle directly, but we find also a contribution from the angle psi, which is the angle between the connecting rod and the horizontal line x here. So L cosine psi. We can insert in this regard, take an abbreviation, lambda equal r divided by L, so the ratio of the two lengths here, um, r for the crank angle, uh, crank shaft and L for the connecting rod, and use for the cosine psi, the trigonometric Pythagoras, then we get one minus sine squared psi. We would get the following relationship. On the one hand, for the first equation we can also introduce lambda, so getting lambda sine phi equals sine psi, a very simple relationship and a more complex one for x, x divided by r would be cosine phi plus 1 divided by lambda square root of 1 minus lambda squared sine squared phi. And now the story does not end here, but I would say it starts here. What is usually done is then that you assume that lambda is sufficiently small, r is much smaller than l, so that you can take the leading order term here of that expression. You can see there is a lambda squared here, so for example you approximate the whole root just by one you know, and then you can do the computations. But uh, this would have an important problem if you try to compare the computed x with the measured x in an experiment. And if you do some kind either of Fourier analysis or some kind of spectral representation, and you will find the influence of the higher order harmonics of phi in x, in the measurement of x. Why is this the case? Well, because your motion is periodic. Periodic with respect to crank angle phi. You know that x then must be a periodic function of phi and that you can represent that periodic function by a Fourier series. And the Fourier series makes visible the contributions from the Fourier terms. So from a spectral analysis, you, it makes visible the whole spectrum. And this representation is not a Fourier series. It's something else. It's the starting point, I would say, of the development of a Fourier series. But it's not, it's neither a power series nor a Fourier series in, in the harmonics. It's some kind of nonlinear function of some harmonic of the crank angle phi. And if you then approximate it, then you suppress all the higher order Fourier series terms and you suppress all these things that you see in the, in the measurements and you cannot relate the measurements, the higher order harmonics, to um, this analysis here if you suppress it right away. So we will take that full term into account and what we want to do is we want to transfer it into a Fourier series. You can imagine that this transformation is technically involved, therefore I would like to show you the steps but not all the detail. Most of these things can be nicely done by symbolic mathematics. So we want to have a Fourier series expansion for x and our starting point is this representation. The first thing is we focus on that root here and represent that root by some kind of power series. If you have a close look on that root then you can write it as square root of 1 minus z 
z being lambda um, squared sine squared phi. So let's look in your mathematical books, tables for a uh, power series representation of the square root of 1 minus z. What you will find is such a result. It's 1 minus the sum running from 1 to infinity, power series, z to the power of n, 2n minus 1 times 2 to the power of 2n. And then you have a binomial coefficient. You know that the binomial coefficient n over k is n faculty divided by k faculty, n minus k faculty. Uh, you know that these binomial coefficients play a role in this Pascal triangle, therefore they are called binomial coefficients. They also play a role in probability and statistics because the, the Pascal triangles in Bernoulli experiments, they play a role because the um, Pascal triangle is a perfect representation of these um, statistics then. So 2n over n, and this power series converges for values of z less than 1, absolute values of z less than 1, and we are happy that we have values of z which are less than 1 and usually much, much less than 1 because lambda is at least not larger than 1, I could say, but usually it's small. Yeah? So lambda squared is also smaller than 1 and, and then you multiply with the sine squared and the sine of phi is at most 1, is bounded by 1. Okay. And sine squared is then bounded by 1 as well. So. So we know that the series converges. We can then represent the cosine psi, which is just the square root of 1 minus lambda squared sine squared phi. We can represent the cosine of psi by this series, where the only thing I did is now I inserted for z um, lambda to the power of 2n, which then yields that the leading factor lambda divided by 2 to the power of 2n and sine to the, for z, sine to the power of 2n phi. And the rest is copied, 2n minus 1, and we have the binomial coefficient 2n over n. If you look at this expression now, you have at least a power series in the sine function, but a power series is not a Fourier series. A Fourier series would be something where you have sine and the argument is some integer number times angle phi. And this is sine to the power of 2n times, uh, or sine phi to the power of 2n, sorry. <laughs> um, so we need some kind of trigonometric relationship, some kind of extension of the classical trigonometric relationships that you find for products of sine and cosine function or sine function by itself. And there is a nice relationship for this sine to the power of 2n. It's 1 divided by 2 to the power of 2n. Nice, we have it here. <laughs> 2n over n plus 2 times, and then it's a recursive formulation, k equal to 0, n minus 1, minus 1, n minus k, 2n over k, cosine 2n minus k, phi. So now we have to plug in this result here, and then we have to sort the terms for um, terms relating to the same Fourier order, so to the same order of that function cosine. And you can see that this is exactly the point where things start to get technically involved and where no progress, at least, um, is involved in the derivation of the formulation. So in kind of intellectual progress, I would say it's just technical computation. And therefore, I would like to skip that fact here, so the insertion of that formula into this one and then equating the terms and just present you that result. And this result is really important, namely it's uh, included in many, many textbooks, you could say perhaps old-fashioned textbooks <laughs> on engines, uh, but, um, well, it's also in, in the modern form, it's included in special software related to engines. Yeah. So it, it's really the building block here um, for the analysis, for your analysis of the, crank, of the slider crank mechanism. So for the connection rod angle psi, for the cosine of psi, we find the following representation. And what's important um, is here to show you 
that it is a special kind of cosine series. Namely, you can see it's a cosine, uh, a Fourier cosine series. And only the even terms in the cosine, so 2k, are involved in that series. And now what can be said about these coefficients here? These coefficients are also uh, listed in a table in textbooks no? or are included in that software. So if for, the, for the lowest coefficient, you find that it, it's with 1 divided by lambda, starts with 1 divided by lambda, and then you have higher powers of lambda. You can see that only the odd powers are involved, and you can also see that the coefficients depay, de decay quite rapidly. 1, 1 divided by 4, 3 divided by 64. So you have, I would say, a double decay here. The first one is due to the power of lambda, and the fact that lambda is less and usually much less than 1. The second is due to the decay of that coefficient. And now if you look at these different coefficients, a, 0, a, 2, a, 4, then you see that the leading power is even a, always a little bit higher and that the leading factor is always lower. So the same can be said, what can be said internally for each coefficient can be said by comparing all these coefficients. So the, the first order or highest order terms of the lowest coefficients are much more important than the other terms in the higher order coefficients. And this gives, I would say, a kind of justification to reduce the whole analysis as is usually done in, in general engineering mechanics courses to um, to the fact that you assume small values for lambda and then you drop everything perhaps except for a naught. Now, that would be always already generous, I would say. But as I said, it does not correspond to experiments. In experiments, you would observe these terms. And what is important for me to show, if you measure, if you would measure angle psi, and yet you would represent the angle cosine psi, you, would, you should find only the even cosine harmonics, if you find something else, then at least it does not correspond to this theory here. Now, what we want to compute is not the cosine of psi. This is an intermediate result, but we use that result in order to derive a formula for the linear displacement, for the piston stroke displacement or whatsoever. So what you learn for the piston stroke is you have a Fourier cosine series um, where only even higher harmonics are included, with perhaps one exception, the first order, therefore higher harmonics. And the first order is the odd harmonic. You will also find that constant A naught here. And then you find higher order harmonics. And in your analysis in classical engineering mechanics, uh, courses that are not specially devoted to slider crank mechanism, usually this part is neglected here. And one stops with that simple expression cosine phi plus a naught no, at most. Okay. Now, when it comes to um, a dynamic analysis, we do not need only the displacement, but we need the acceleration in order to compute the reaction forces due to the mass accelerations due to the inertia terms here. So we have to take the second derivative of this expression. Well, this can be easily done, but it needs some place. So uh, the second derivative is shown here. Well, keep in mind that your angle phi is time dependent. If you have a stationary motion, then only the first term, or at least approximately stationary motion, only the first term will be present. And you see the same conclusion holds. It com contains higher order even harmonics and one odd lowest order harmonic. And then we would have sine harmonics if we consider here uh, non-stationary uh, motion. So if you measure the linear acceleration, and you find some sine harmonic contributions, then you see they come from non stationary motion. Everything that is in the cosine is measured is a stationary motion. That's already a very important conclusion.
Um, okay, so we finished our analysis for the linear motion for the piston stroke. So we are able for the cylinder or for the piston stroke to, with that result, to compute the inertia forces. However, and unfortunately, there is also an influence on inertia forces or inertia inf in effect coming from the connection rod. And the connection rod is the part that, um, full, that fulfills the most difficult motion. Namely, on the one hand, it on the one end it rotates, on the other hand, it has the linear motion. It's the connection between the rotating and the linear motion. So first of all, we need therefore the angular acceleration psi double dot as well. How can we obtain that expression from what we know? What we know is the cosine of psi under no. Let's take the derivative of the cosine of psi with respect to time. Then what we get is the inner derivative minus psi, oh, psi dot, and then from the outer derivative we get minus psi 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 dot. This is good result because for sine psi we have the simple kinematic relationship, namely it's equal to lambda times sine phi. Therefore, we can solve that equation for psi dot already. So we would have that psi dot is equal to take the time derivative of that lengthy expression of cosine psi and divide the whole thing by sine phi and also by lambda and change the sign to negative one. So this would be the result. This would be the calculation procedure to obtain psi dot, the, the angular velocity, and then take again the derivative with respect to time of that expression here, you will get the angular acceleration. So this is the computational program we have to follow now. And you can imagine that it becomes quite involved because you have to divide here by sine phi and taking also the derivative with respect to time. So let's do it step by step. We start with the cosine psi series, Fourier series expansion that you can see again here. We take the derivative with respect to time. As you can see, taking the time derivative, I went one step back. I do not start with the cosine psi series representation as seen here, Fourier series representation, but I start with the power series representation again, which you can see, well, it's just that slight modification that you take the derivative with respect to time here, you can see it, and then the cosine phi and in the 2n. So before we had sine 2n phi divided by 2n, 2n over n, lambda divided by 2, 2n. Um, why do we start at that point and not with this representation? Because we have to divide by sine phi. And you can see this is the cosine uh, series representation. You, you cannot divide by phi here. Well, you can, of course, formally divide by phi, but it will not lead to any simplification. So we have to start with the power of series. This result now can be easily um, divided by sine phi. You just lower the, uh, the power here of the sine term. But then, of course, we have to use our trigonometric relationship once again. This is done on the next slide. So now we have copied the result for taking the derivative of, with respect to time of the power series representation of the cosine psi. We divide by lambda and by sine phi. And then we get terms that contain cosine phi. And if we do, if we use the classical trigonometric representation of the powers of sine phi, which we saw for the piston stroke or for the cosine psi expression, then what we have to do, we have to multiply once again this with the cosine phi. So we come back from that sine 2n minus 1 to an even order cosine Fourier series representation. We multiply each term by the cosine of phi and we make use of this tiny little relationship, which is just a classical addition theorem for the cosine, in order to represent it by half cosine 2n plus 1 phi plus cosine 2n minus 1 phi. From that result, you can see that we switch now from having 
even order cosine Fourier series representation to odd order cosine series representation. If all the computations are done, you get the following expression for psi dot, namely you get a Fourier cosine series with odd order harmonics with some coefficients c to k minus 1, but that also can be also found in tables and for which the same convergence behavior holds with respect to lambda um, as before. So you start and then you have this double, I would say, double reduction. The coefficients of factors here decrease and the power of lambda increase. Now it's the even power of lambda that is included here increase and for the next term you start with the next higher power and with the lower leading coefficient and so on and so on. So the same holds here. Now we have psi dot and now we take the derivative of that expression with respect to time on the next slide. So second derivative, the angular acceleration and again you obtain one term that is now the um, stationary term and one term that is now the non-stationary term. And now you get an odd order sine harmonic representation for your sine harmonic representation for the stationary part of that angular acceleration. And if you measure it and you will find some odd order cosine harmonics in the spectrum, then you know that this is the influence of the non-stationary motion and usually that influence should be small. So let me summarize for stationary operation we get a Fourier sine series and odd harmonics. Okay, even now we are not able to write down the equations that allows us to compute the reaction forces. Why? Because when we want to compute the bearing forces the model of the connecting rod that we use at the moment, namely it's a rigid body, and somewhere in between that connecting rod there is the center of gravity, and the motion of the center of gravity is a quite complicated motion. It's neither a circular motion for the, as for the connection point A to the crank, it's neither a linear motion as for the connecting point B, but it's something in between. And this makes the things so difficult. So therefore, let's replace that model for the connecting rod by two mass points, M sub A and M sub B, that are then concentrated in these connection points to the other parts, A and B, so that mass point A moves on a circle. So it's a simple circular motion easy to analyze. In stationary case you just get the centrifugal force and for point B it's a linear motion so it's just a linear acceleration so also easy to analyze. Of course we cannot just split the mass somehow to A and B. We have to satisfy certain conditions such that that split of mass is equivalent in a certain sense. What is equivalent? You do not want to change the total mass of the system, you do not want to change the center of gravity here, and you do not want to change the mass moment of inertia. If you do not change these three quantities, then from an inertia point of view, so from a dynamic point of view, that replacement system would be equivalent, as long as we are dealing of course with rigid bodies. If your connection rod happens to be flexible and this doesn't work, of course. Yeah. So, requirements are the mass and the mass moment of inertia remain unchanged. The center of gravity of the connection rod is unchanged. So, one could say these are three conditions, but just two quantities, right? M sub A and M sub B that we want to determine. Now, there is a third quantity involved. It's written, tiny little written here we will modify the mass moment of inertia of the replaced system. So the replaced system will be replaced by some mass point m sub a, some mass point m sub b, 
and a reduced or modified mass moment of inertia, such that these three conditions are satisfied. We have to change the mass moment of inertia because due to these mass points, by Steiner's law, so there will be a Steiner effect, call it Steiner contribution to the mass moment of inertia, and therefore it's a reduction, therefore we have to reduce the mass moment of inertia appropriately because of the existence of these Steiner contributions from M sub A and M sub B. Yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't work. Okay, so three conditions or requirements and three parameters to define, define uh, to determine should work well. Let's look at the next slide, how it works. So MP, the total mass of the, we call in German ployer, the connecting rod, is the sum of MA plus MB. It's the first condition. The second one is that um, the position of the center of gravity remains unchanged. So if you multiply MA by its lever minus SP plus MB by L minus SP, imagine that you have a G here, then you would have the, uh, the um, um, forces due to gravity that should be balanced, should be equal to zero. Would be two conditions, two conditions that govern M sub A and M sub B. So a linear system with two parameters, easy to be solved. You get MA is one minus SP divided by L times MP and MB is SP divided by L times MP. You can easily plug this into this equation to see that at the very end, if you add MA and MB, you obtain once again MP. And if you multiply by the appropriate level, then you see that these factors are the same as with the opposite sign for the first term and for the second term. And so the factors in front of MP, the same, but with opposite sign, then the sum yields zero. Everything okay for M sub A and N sub B. And now we need the mass moment of inertia, the reduced mass moment of inertia, and as I said, we have to take the contributions, the Steiner contributions, into account. So your JSP, our original mass moment of inertia, is now the new mass moment of inertia we are looking for, we want to compute, plus the Steiner contributions of our model, which is M sub A mass of that mass point times the distance squared, SP squared, M sub B times the distance L minus SP squared, and now you insert the results for MA and MB, you solve for GSP reduced, and you get its GSP minus MP, L minus SP times SP, and in fact, it's a reduction of the mass moment of inertia due to these Steiner contributions here. Okay, now we are able to build the equations that govern the reaction forces. What kind of reaction forces do we take into account? You can see that originally one would compute a horizontal force in the bearing, a vertical bearing force, and there must be a vertical force for the support of the cylinder or the piston. But what is usually done, and this is engine, not engineering, but engine literature, I would say, um, so their specialty, I, I don't know why. Um, the total force in vertical direction, they take into account the total for or the, the horizontal force Fx, it's the total force in horizontal direction, and then a quantity, a torque that is called the circular torque, which is obtained by taking the distance of the cylinder X and multiply it by that component, and of course by F, I call it YKO, KO for Kolben, so the vertical force acting at the piston. And of course, if you know that quantity, the circular torque, then by dividing by X, you would get that vertical force, and by taking the total vertical force minus that force, you would be able to determine that bearing force. So I don't know why they've chosen these three other quantities, but that's the way it's dealt with in classical textbooks. So therefore, let's follow their approach. Yeah? So let's compute the com complete vertical force. Well, 
The only inertia effects that are present there are included in that figure. We have from the mass point A and of course from the crank, but with the different radius, we have a centrifugal forces that can be summed up in being a contribution of Ma times, well, if this is R, then it's R times omega squared. And then you have the contribution of the um, crank times the center of gravity or the distance of the center of gravity, which is SKO for S SKU for Kobel for crank, and also multiplied by omega squared. On the other hand, you would have a horizontal inertia force located at the piston, which is now the sum of mb and the mass of the piston times the acceleration in horizontal direction. And then you have that contribution here from our reduced uh, mass moment of inertia and phi and psi, sorry, psi double dot the angular acceleration. So for the vertical force, you take into account the projection of this centrifugal force in vertical direction, which is the sine function of angle phi. You can see that this is the contribution um, in Fy direction, as all the term in the sense of D'Alembert would be at the same side of the equation in a, in a classical balance in the sense of D'Alembert. If you solve for F sub Y, you get that negative sign here, the leading negative sign. You get the inertia centrifugal force MKU SKU plus MAR times omega squared, and you project it by a sine function in the vertical direction. For the horizontal direction, you get the same, but in the cosine phi projection, and you get here, finally, the influence of the piston uh, mass and the MB, the um, mass of the, uh, of the mass point B, and that is multiplied with the acceleration X double dot. Well, if you do the computations, then you can insert here the equation now for the second derivative of x. And what you can see now is that you get an expression that contains a low order cosine harmonic, but also even order cosine harmonics for the horizontal force fx. So if you measure that horizontal force fx, you will see all these forces there. And finally, for mu, you get JSP reduced times psi double dot with a negative sign. So it's FYKOX, and that is balanced by JSP red times psi double dot. And also here you can now insert the expression for the angular acceleration. And what you see is you get an odd order um, sine harmonic. So therefore, it's very nice if you measure that m sub u, you should see odd order sine harmonics. If you measure fx, you should see higher order, even order cosine harmonics. All the other effects would be perhaps or could be perhaps attributed to some non-stationary phenomena or to some other effects that we do not include in our model here. Now the question is, if you have a closer look on that result, it's just copied here, you see that these forces and also this circular torque, they increase with the square of omega. That's nothing new for us. That's something we have seen in many rotor dynamic uh, computations. And also here it makes sense because it's some kind of rotating mass point. So it's some kind of well, imbalance. It's not an imbalance, of course, but it's the same effect. It's, a, it's a, the effect of the rotational motion. And we know it appears with omega squared. 
due to the fact that we have in the centrifugal force this omega squared. Yeah. No problem. So the question is, are we able to balance these forces and torques? Well, in order to do this, we have to balance, we have to somehow balance these coefficients, set them to zero because we cannot set omega to zero and neither omega nor the sine of phi. If we introduce some abbreviations here for these coefficients, and so let's call it m, uh, let's call it q prime, it would be the coefficient here for fy, it would be the coefficient of the first two, these first order terms in the cosine phi, um, q prime. If then you term this coefficient mko plus mb times r, for example, as q, and the coefficient jsp reduced and lambda as r. So everything you could try to, to modify, to influence by your design as q prime, qr, you obtain the following equations. I will write down these expressions relating to SKU and SP. We will have a look at that once again. But you get the following situation. You get Fx, Fy is minus omega squared Q prime. Fx is minus omega squared in the first order Q plus Q prime plus Q or the higher order terms. And Mu is omega squared R. And then you have these higher order terms. So when we want to balance this or compensate it, then for the transverse force compensation, we have Q prime equal to zero for the longitudinal force compensation. We would have Q equal to zero and Q plus Q prime equal to zero. If Q prime should be equal to zero, then this amounts to Q equal to zero as the second condition, Q prime equal to zero and Q equal to zero. And from the third equation, we would get capital R equal to zero for approximately stationary situation. Now let's go back and ask yourself, is this possible? Well, if you have a first look at that equation, then you would say, take the second one perhaps, Q equal to zero, is that possible? You get MKO, it's a positive quantity, it's a mass. You can solve this equation for SP. It's the only quantity you can influence by your design. R would be also something you could influence by your design, making a crank longer or not. Um, but you see that doesn't help you. R can't be zero, <laughs> there would be no, no crank. Um, so the only thing is to modify your design of the connecting rod and to determine that SP. What would you obtain for SP if you set this parenthesis to zero? You would obtain SP divided by L equal minus MKO divided by MP, which is a negative quantity. You would obtain a negative result for S sub P. You would think perhaps now that well, is that possible? It's something negative that sounds to be impossible because SP is a length. But SP is a distance. The distance of the center of gravity, which is measured from some point. Which point? We took the point A, the connection point between crank and connecting rod as the starting point of our coordinate. We measure in the direction of the connection rod and after SP, we find the center of gravity. Now what happens if the point, if that center of gravity moves to the left of point A, so to the opposite direction, then the distance would be negative. It would be, because our origin is and, and the axis is aligned with the connection rod, it would be a negative one. So having a negative outcome for SP means which is enforced by having q equal to zero, means we have to design our connection rod such that there is a big block of mass beyond that point A, so to the left of the, that point A, and that big block of mass must be so big that the center of gravity of the whole connection rod moves left to the point A. Same reasoning for q prime equal to zero and for the fact that we want to determine SKU. 
As you can see from that equation here, if you solve for SKU and if SP is negative, then this factor would be positive, R would be positive as, as well, it's a radius, MP is positive, MQ is positive. And if you want that this parenthesis vanishes, then SKU would again be a negative quantity. So for the crank, the same holds. At the origin, you measure the center of gravity, SKU, the distance from the center of, uh, from the origin of the crank, which is the rotation center of that crank. Now beyond that rotation center, so not in the direction of the crank, but opposite to the crank, you would add a new, a big block of mass. Yeah? Such a block of mass that the center of gravity moves from what was your crank to the opposite side, so that SKU becomes negative. And then you will be able to satisfy these conditions. For R, things are much more simpler. For R, we get a direct relationship between JSP and MP, and that relationship can be satisfied usually by a smart design, by a good design of the connection. So don't, don't worry too much about R, but worry about Q prime and Q. Yeah? So what we see is that there's one possibility, let me come back to the conclusions, that complete longitudinal force compensation, that one here, um, comprises transverse force compensation because Q, Q equals zero implies Q prime equal to zero, then from the second equation, and this implies the transverse force compensation already. However, that longitudinal force comp compensation, so Q equal to zero and Q prime equal to zero, implies that both SP and SQ are beyond A and zero, beyond the point A and beyond the rotation center of the crank, which is possible or feasible by adding additional masses, but this is often unwanted. First of all, you don't want to spend so much um, in adding some masses which are from a, um, from a operating point of view senseless, so which make your whole design heavier. Also, um, the other components must be heavier then. Second, you very often you do not have that space. If you think of where you usually use engine in, in vehicles, for example, you, know, you do not have that space. You cannot have uh, so much space and also you do not add, want to add in vehicles so much weight just for compensating for some bearing forces. You know? So there must be some other solutions. The first one is, well, if Q is not equal to zero, then what you see is Q prime plus Q equals zero and Q prime equal to zero is impossible. So let's try for a compromise. That would be a second way. So perhaps Q equal to zero would be acceptable for you or at least you don't fix to Q equal to zero and Q prime equal to zero, but you allow for both small deviations. And as a compromise, you want to have that Q plus Q prime is equal to zero, where Q is multiplied weighted by some K, and K is some factor in between zero and one, which means that Q prime is allowed to be less, uh, to be not equal to zero, Q is not equal to zero, and the whole sum should then be equal to zero. Um, would be the second solution. The first one is the complete longitudinal force compensation by some design. Does that make sense or not? Okay, the compromise would be the second solution. Let me remark that the torque compensation is not a problem. Let me remark that the reaction torque would be also in mx and my um, present due to the distance of the crankshaft bearings, so they are not located directly in that line uh, with, with the whole slider crank mechanism, but perhaps to the left and to the right from the uh, 
on the slider crank mechanism. Uh, the comp compensation conditions are, however, identical to that co compensation conditions we saw here. Now the question is, is there a third way and perhaps a much better way to compensate these forces than we did here? And there is, and also for this analysis, you need the whole range of higher order harmonics. Namely, this reciprocating engine would be something you would never use for a car or even a, any kind of vehicle. I don't know, is there a kind of vehicle where you have a one cylinder engine? At least you would have two cylinders or four cylinders. So an idea is, to have several of these ladder crank mechanisms and to organize them in such a way that these bearing force contributions cancel each other. And I will show you this already for the two cylinder, two stroke engine. So we have a crank angle, and this is the, the basic idea that we have a shift in the crank angle. So for one cylinder, we start with phi one. And for the other one, we start at position phi 1 plus, plus psi, so opposite. And then we see that these effects will cancel. That's a small computation here. We add the two longitudinal bearing forces to form the total bearing forces, longitudinal bearing force of these two um, slider crank mechanism. So we write the same equation here, but once we write it with phi 1 and the the second time we write it with phi 2, all the other parameters are the same, so the same coefficients here. So two identical slider crank mechanism. The only thing is we have a phase shift, therefore I insert it for phi 2, phi 1 plus pi. And here you can see I also inserted phi 1 plus pi, and this yields 2k phi 1 plus 2k pi in the argument of the cosine. Now what happens? Well, the cosine of phi 1 and the cosine of phi 1 plus pi is just the same as opposite. The terms will cancel. For the higher order harmonics, this can't be say, as we have here 2k pi, so even order um, periodicity to take into account. So these effect then the, the higher order effects, higher, higher order effects, I would say. So the low, lowest order effect will cancel, the higher order effects here will double. But this might be acceptable that they double as the first order terms, the leading terms, go away. And what we learned is that these coefficients decrease rapidly. If you are not satisfied with that result, and I can understand this, there's a big difference between a two-cylinder and a four-cylinder engine, then move to a four-cylinder engine. Now, here for our two-cylinder, two-stroke engine, that's all what we can achieve for fx. Now let's see what we can achieve for f sub y, for the vertical force, and for our circular torque. And then you can see that for the vertical force, you are really, really happy, because you can remove the whole vertical force. You have sine phi 1, you have the same coefficients, but the angle is now phi 2, so phi sub 1 plus pi, and sine phi 1 is equal to minus sine phi 1 plus pi, and therefore these two terms cancel, and you have an exact zero here. No, uh, exact, as long as we consider stationary motion, of course. No. And finally, the circular torque. You do the same, you write down the equation, with phi sub 1, we will write down the equation again, but you insert here instead of phi sub 1, you insert phi sub 1 plus pi. For angle phi sub 2, you obtain sine 2k minus 1, hot harmonics, plus 2k minus 1 psi. And again, you will find that this term is just the same as before, but with opposite sign, so also the circular torque is equal to zero. And this shows to you that the two-cylinder engine, already the two-cylinder engine, is a big effort when compared to a simple slider crank mechanism when it comes to the bearing forces. Already this idea to take a second one, but um, with a phase shift, leads to a vertical force that is zero, to a circular torque that is zero, and finally to a reduction of the um, 
longitudinal forces and a remove of the lowest order contribution in the crank angle in the longitudinal force. If you want to achieve higher order effect, effects, you need another design of your reciprocating engine. So by taking, for example, more cylinders into account. Now, let me summarize the result again. So we see that the longitudinal force compensation is possible until first order. The transverse force is compensated, the circular torque is compensated. And again, for a four-cylinder two-stroke engine, you will find a longitudinal force compensation under third order. So then it works order by order, so to speak. There is not such a big step as from moving to, from the one-cylinder to a two-cylinder engine. And you maintain transverse and circular torque compensation. Now let me move to the last point, which is the question of a stationary motion that was always assumed here. And as I said at the very beginning, for this case, for this mechanism, there is no stationary motion, but there is something that comes close to a stationary motion or a motion that can be controlled. Let me show first of all how one can derive the equations of motion. Let me remind that until now we were not interested in the equations of motion by itself. We assumed a certain, certain stationary motion and we computed the bearing forces. And much the same way we did, for example, for bending vibrations, Jeffcott rotor or rigid rotors even, um, where we studied the stationarity condition to get the stationary motion, a stationary solution. And then we assume that we are in that stationary situation so that we have a constant omega, a constant rotational speed, which would be here the speed of the crank. And we compute the bearing forces. Here we did the first step or the second step first. So we first computed the bearing forces and the circular torque, of course, and discussed how to compensate them and assumed a stationary operation. And now let's move to the question um, about the stationary um, motion. And here, well, that's why I put it at the very end. I will be, well, not very precise, I would admit here. I will not derive the equations of motion, but show to you how one would derive them. Well, we could start with the power balance. So a balance of kinetic and potential energy, which is then where you can take the difference, uh, so the time derivative. And then you have on the right hand side all the other effects that could bear. So there could be, for example, piston force, which is multiplied with x dot. There could be some kind of usable torque here, m sub n, omega. And there could be some kind of friction or resistance or whatsoever effect, so some kind of losses from the point of view of the mechanical system. So therefore, there could be some kind of power losses to the mechanical system. So you get minus P sub R. If you insert here, instead of D by DT, a differential of the angle D sub phi equal omega dt, you get the following equation omega d by d phi, phi is the crank angle here, t plus v equal fx dot minus m and omega minus p sub r. Now you have to specify kinetic and potential energy with respect to crank angle for that mechanism, and then you take the derivative with respect to the angle, you multiply it by omega, and you would get the equations of motion. You would get because I don't want to derive them here. I would like to say that only a numerical solution is possible for this equation and therefore an analytical derivation of equations that then you have to solve numerically wouldn't make much sense. One would see that um, there is no true stationary operation. So if there is no stationary operation, then are the results before are wrong or not usable in practice or what? No. There is a kind of average rotational velocity, so average and average constant rotational velocities, velocity of the crank. And there are fluctuations around that average value. And you can control these fluctuations 
Well, if you control fluctuations, you should also control, of course, the derivative and to, to say that it remains small, that, there are, that these uh, non-stationary effects are reduced. And I would like to show you one device of how to control these um, fluctuations around an average constant rotational velocity. And this is obtained from a power balance and by some additional device, namely by a flywheel. The idea is that, well, of course, you prescribe your wanted average rotational velocity. You prescribe a certain uniformity level. So I would say a kind of level in which these fluctuations should be concentrated. And you use that flywheel to store some kind of energy and to provide some kind of energy uh, depending on the difference between, again, what the system provides as torque and what is needed minus mn or used from that engine. And that difference must be somehow either stored or if it becomes negative, of course, then provided to the system in order to maintain that average rotational velocity. And therefore, we have to de design that flywheel. Designing that flywheel, I mean, we are not uh, here designers in the sense that we, that we want to design uh, forming some kind of shapes, but we want to determine the mass moment of inertia. That's designing a flywheel here. In the mechanical sense, we want to determine the mass moment of inertia of that flywheel. How do we do that? Last computation in that course. So we start with that excess, M -U -U for Überschuss, German word, which is the mass moment of inertia of our flywheel, we want to determine, times omega dot, was balanced by that quantity which is written as half j of the flywheel times the derivative of omega squared with respect to phi. Why? Because here we have the time derivative omega dot. Instead of taking the time derivative, we take the derivative with respect to phi. And then we have to take the derivative of phi with respect to t, which amounts to omega the rotational velocity. Now for that equation, d omega by d phi times omega, we apply the product rule and this yields half d omega squared by d phi because if you apply the product rule to omega squared, you get two times d omega d phi, which is multiplied by omega. So you get two times this result. So therefore the factor I half here. So we can represent omega dot by half d omega squared d phi. And this is the expression here. Now we integrate, for example, over one period or between, let's make it more general, between two crank angles phi sub 1 and phi sub 2. We either measure or determine the left-hand side of that equation. So either you determine the mu or you uh, determine in the sense of simulated or you measure it, that quantity. And you know that on the opposite side, you have half J Schwungert, which is a constant. And we have to integrate now omega d omega squared d phi. And that's good that we have a derivative with respect to phi, because then that integration is just omega square, 2 squared minus omega 1 squared, where omega 2 is the rotational velocity related to um, angle phi 2. And Omega 1 is the rotational velocity related to angle phi 1 or in position phi 1. We are interested in the extreme cases of this excess, Überschuss. So we seek the maximum of that case. Uh, determine the angle phi 1 and phi 2 such that we obtain the maximum. Now maybe it's one period, I don't know. So, on the right hand side, we gen then have for this situation the maximum, so phi 2 and phi 1 for the maximum and minimum position omega squared max minus omega squared min. We can write this equation by the binomial formula to be omega max plus omega min times omega max minus omega min. And now 
we relate this to the given two parameters, omega m and epsilon. So we make them appear on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we have that measured quantity and we can solve the whole equation of measured or simulated quantity. We solve the whole equation for your Schwungrad. And this is the last slide in this course here. This was our result. Now, omega m, the mean velocity is just half omega max plus omega min. That's good. So this is omega m if you take the half into account. Epsilon is just omega max minus omega min, the difference, by omega m. So in total, what we find then is that measured or simulated quantity is equal to j Schwungrad, j of the flywheel, omega m squared times epsilon. You solve for j Schwungrad, j flywheel, and you find that this measured or simulated quantity divided by your wanted parameters by epsilon and omega m squared is equal to the design value of your flywheel. And here it is, the formula how to design that flywheel. Yes, and that's all I would like to tell you about the reciprocating engine. That's all I want, wanted to tell you in that course on machine dynamics. So you have seen something on the installation of rigid machines. We have seen the Jeffcott rotors, so the bending vibrations. We have seen the balancing of rigid rotors. We have seen torsional vibrations in drivetrains, and we have analyzed in detail and understood the, also the higher order harmonics of a reciprocating engine and how to reduce them. And finally, how to maintain a stationary operation. That's quite a lot. And I hope you enjoyed that course. I wish you all the best for your exam and see you perhaps in some other course. Uh, on dynamics. Thank you very much for your attention. See you at the next opportunity. Goodbye.